Good morning. How are you? Well, here is something that you might love. As of last Wednesday, you don't have to just settle for a like response on Facebook. <laughs> Facebook wanted to offer more options for a reaction, uh, and they thought, well, you know, there's more emotions than likes, not even emotion anyway. So they call in these psychologists. They say, what are, what are our options? We, wanna, we want people to be able to react with more emotions. And they said, well, you're going to need 20, 30 different options because there's so many different emotions and uh, that's just to start just starting it off and they go well we don't want that so they brought in a different team of experts and they uh, uh they used them to scour all of the responses over the last several years on facebook's 1.6 billion users globally across culture and they thought well let's categorize these and see if we can see uh, uh gen you know categories and generalities around these and so they did they found they took all of these responses and they found five emotions that kept coming up over and over and so those are the new responses that, that you can you can uh, give here they are if you want to see them love ha ha Yay, wow, sad, angry. You didn't know that your, all your emotions could be summarized so easily, right? <laughs> they asked Mark Zuckerberg, what is the most common one of the five? And he said, oh, by far, love, love. Well, we're talking about the power of love. And today we're going to be discussing real briefly uh, this whole concept of the angle of uh, humility that being humble is part of love. I'm certainly not an expert in this area, so I'm kind of a co-struggler trying to learn how to be humble, but it, it, is, it is an aspect of love. It is part of what God says is this, this, this if we're going to be loving, this is part of what we do. The problem with love, though, is to see, I mean, with humility, is, is a lot of times people think that's not like up there on their top rating scale. That's what I want to be is humble. Because in our minds, we think to ourselves, well, a lot of times it's the confident people, right? And they don't come off as humble. Usually confident is just like one step away from arrogance, right? Or, you know, this overconfidence. And, 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 and those are the people that tend to succeed. <clears throat> just look at the, uh, the, the landscape of the presidential candidates. And they're, some of them aren't really known for humility. And yet here they are. They're, they seem to be doing okay. And and, and so in our minds, we think, well, I want to do well in life. I want to succeed. And so I need, I need that kind of stuff, not humility. But the problem is, is we, we don't understand what humility really is. See, humility is not thinking poorly about yourself. It's, it's not having a bad self-esteem. It's not uh, degrading yourself. It's, it's, you're not, it's not being a wimp. In fact, it takes a lot of courage to be humble, which we'll look at in just a moment. It takes a lot of courage, a lot of self-confidence to be humble. In fact, it's the opposite. Pride is really just a cover-up for low self-esteem. People that always have to talk about how great they are and they're always dominating conversations, putting people down, degrading people, that's just representative of their own problems, their own self, their own poor self-esteem, their own lack of self-confidence. So they talk about how wealthy they are or how, how powerful they are or how great they are. Every time you see that, you know that's an indication of, of somebody who's got insecurities and they're trying to cover up their insecurities. Jesus was incredibly humble. He didn't, str he didn't have to do that. He didn't have to go talk around about how great he was. And he was able to wash the disciples' feet because he was incredibly secure in himself. He knew he who he was and what he was supposed to do in this life. So what I want to do... <clears throat> And as I said briefly, is just look at some of the things we can do to become more humble. The Bible says love <clears throat> is not conceited or proud. So we don't, we don't, we're not talking about that kind of, of, uh, of behavior. In fact, if, there's more verses than I can put on your outline, but there's a lot of verses that talk about the promises that come from being humble. The Bible says God saves the humble. God supports the humble. God promises to guide the humble. God gives wisdom to the humble. God will rescue the humble. He promises to exalt the humble. And there's a lot of things where he says, you know, this is, this is the way I want you to be. In fact, he says he hates 
he hates the pride, the, the proud. In fact, in, uh, in Proverbs, for example, he lists seven things he hates, God hates. Number one is pride, right? It's pride. He goes, that, I don't like that at all. Isaiah 66 says, the people I treasure most are the humble. They depend on me. Humility is the aspect of what we want to go for. Now, I want to just give a definition of what humility is. Humility, it's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of others instead of yourself and acting in their best interest instead of your own. So it's not, it's not thinking bad of ourselves. It's just not thinking of ourselves. It's thinking, I want to be, I'm concerned about what other people are, are doing. And, and the good news is it's a choice. Love is has feelings, but love is not a feeling, as we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. It's, it's something we do. It's something we choose to do, which is good news because it means we can grow in this area of humility. We can practice it. 1 John 3.18 says, let us not just talk about love, let us practice real love. So if you've ever taken music lessons, you, you, have you ever taken music lessons? If you've ever had music lessons, let me see. Yeah, quite a few of you. You know that you need to practice as well. And if you've ever played on a sports team, you know that there's practice. If you've ever gone to a gym for more than two weeks in a row, you know, <laughs> you know there's, there's hard work and you can get better at something. And that's true with this area of humility. You say, well, I don't feel very humble. Well, it doesn't really matter what you feel. It's just, a, it's like love. It's, it's, it can cause feelings, but love is not a feeling. It's what you do. So you can choose to become more humble. And so can I. Let's look at four things that we can do. Number one is practice giving preference to others. Now, we have an opportunity to do this all the time. All the time. We, it's, it's dying to ourselves saying, I'm, it's not about me. I'm not going to be selfish. I want to prefer somebody else. And so you go to, it can be something small. You, you go to a restaurant. Every, you get served your food first, right? And then for some reason, everybody else isn't served yet. You do you just dig right in? Sorry, you guys are out of luck, man. This food looks good. You, or do you do you wait? You know, I mean, right? If you know a little about about social norms, you wait until everybody's served. Why? Because you're preferring others. So we do it. Sometimes we just know to do it because it's the right thing. Other times we have choices, like you know, we're driving and somebody, you know, you and another person, we're trying to get the same lane, and you have a chance to prefer somebody there. You go to Kroger or something, and there's, there's, a, there's a line, or wherever you shop at, you know, there's a line, and, uh, and, and, and you're in the long line, the slow line, and you're thinking, how can I get out of this, right? And, and then another line uh, uh, down, you know, a few registers down opens up, and you notice it. You, can, you have some options, right? <laughs> you can beeline it over there, or you can say, hey, you were in, you know, in there before, you know, there's a line open over there, you know, or you can have lots of options. When, you, when you're parking here at, at, at the vineyard, you come 10 minutes late, some of you come late, and uh, it, your kids have been rowdy in the car, and, and, and there you are, there's a, a spot that opens up, and somebody else is kind of, you know, vying for that. You have a chance to, to prefer somebody. You go to a church picnic, the long line sometimes to get something to eat, you know, those kinds of things. You have a chance. So over and over, we have opportunities to prefer others in our home, at our workplace. And that's one of the ways that it's, we practice humility. So not, it's, I'm thinking about somebody else. I'm not just thinking about myself. Romans 12.10 says, give preference to one another in honor. And so that's a way that we honor somebody else as we give preference to them. Jesus gave preference to all of us. When he, when, he, when he left heaven, he came to earth, and he preferred us over the comforts of heaven. And then he went, and, and, uh, went to the cross for us so that we could have our wrongdoings atoned for, so that we, have, we can be at one for, with God. That, that's, that's preferring, and he demonstrated that in loving humility. Philippians says, don't push your way to the front. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourself long enough to lead a helping hand, lend a helping hand. Uh, think of yourselves the way Jesus thought of himself. He was God, but he took on the status of a slave, an incredible humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, 
obedient life. So Jesus understood it, and he, and he lived that, that, that humble life. So preferring others, another way you can do that is learning to listen instead of always talking. You know, some people, they, they, they always don't want to dominate the conversation, right? And instead of listening, and when we listen, we're preferring somebody else because we're allowing somebody else to talk. James 1.19 says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And if we do the first two, this, the last one seems to come a little lazier, right? If we're listening, we're slow to speak. Sharon and I, our first home that we owned was in Damneck. So we lived uh, near Oceana on the crosswind leg of the, uh, of, of, for the, for the F-A-18s, uh, Hornets and Super Hornets, as they would come and land. Very, pretty loud planes. So we'd be, you know, you just, the, you, if you live in that, near, near the jets, you get used to it. You know, you're out talking to your neighbors, and it's so loud you can't talk, you know. So you just, as the jet goes by, you just kind of just look at each other and look around a little bit and check your phone or something. Then you start talking again. And at home, you just get used to it. You just, it just kind of goes away after a while. It, just, it, you, it, it drowns, it eventually it's just drowned out, right? That's true with people that talk all the time. People that are always filling the room with noise. You just kind of, there they go again, you know. It's talking away. They're like jet noise, you know. Just. <laughs> we have a chance to listen and say, you know what? I want to listen. I want to be the, that's preferring other people. Second way you can practice humility is practice learning from others. Learning from others. Being open to suggestions. Let, inviting people to speak into your life. Saying, hey, I realize I don't know it all. And so I can grow from your input. I can grow from your corrections, your suggestions. Now, there's some good things that come out about being somebody who not only prefers others, but also when you practice learning from others, one of the things that will make you more likable, people like to be around somebody who uh, is, is open to correction, is open to learning. Right? They, don't, they don't know it all. Uh, Proverbs 15, 12 says, Conceited people do not like to be corrected. They never ask for advice. And so if you're never open to teaching, people go, I don't want to be around you. You, you already know everything. You'll also be wiser because you actually do learn something. If you reject criticism, Proverbs says, you only harm yourself. But if you listen to corrections, you grow in understanding. Humble people are, are always learning because they're open to correction. They invite that into their life. Say, hey, I realize I don't know everything. And, and you, 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 know, you know things I don't know. I know some things maybe that you don't know. You know things that people next to you don't know. We can learn from one another, but we've got to be willing to do that. We talked about here at our leaders, we always say our leaders are learners because we always have to be willing to grow and, and stretch and, and open our, uh, widen our horizons. What, what am I missing? We, it's interesting, you know, a lot of times we can't see our own blind spots. That's why they're called blind spots. Other people can see them. So if we're open to it, they can, we, we grow from that. And then we'll also have less conflict. Pride only leads to conflicts. It's, we end up with conflict when we're, when we're prideful. And so You'll probably have an argument sometime this week with somebody you know, somebody you love, somebody you don't love. And, and when that happens, you can remind yourself, hey, maybe this is an opportunity for me to practice humility. Because if I just continue in my pride, I'll just, I'll just keep arguing. I just add more fuel to the fire. And we can grow in that way. You know, the Bible says, that Jesus said that. He goes, I want you to be childlike not childish, but childlike in our faith. We, because children have that aspect of humility. They realize they don't learn it all. They, know, they don't know it all, right? There's areas they can grow, and they want to grow in that area. Number three, I can practice uh, being humble by admitting I'm wrong when I admit I'm wrong. Now, some of you say, well, this is easy. I'm not wrong. So I've already got this one. <laughs> I say that in jest, but sometimes we think that, right? Well, I, I'm not wrong very often. It's everybody else. And so that's an area where a lot of times we can grow because it's just admitting our mistakes, recognizing I'm not perfect. I, I, there's some things I can do to grow, and I need to be willing to say I'm sorry. I need to be willing to, to, to uh, admit I've made mistakes. Reminds me of the lady who went on uh, she was away at work. Her husband was home with the kids, watching the house and the kids. And so she calls him up. She goes, um, how are things going? Uh, th I appreciate you watching the kids, watching the house. What's, what's up? He goes, well, not that good. Unfortunately, our poodle died. She goes, 
that's terrible news. She goes, but what's even worse is the way you just kind of dropped it in on me. You didn't, you know, you didn't warm me up or get me used to that bad news. He goes, well, how would you want me to say it? She goes, well, maybe like the first day I call you, you say, I don't know how it happened, but the poodle got on the roof. <laughs> and then I'll call the next day and the next day you'll say, you know, and, and I was trying to get the dog off the roof and poodle fell and he's injured. It's not doing well. And then the third day, you can just say, well, you know, the poodle died. And then I'm kind of, uh, you know, you wore me up to it. He goes, well, I'll try to do better. So she goes, well, let's just change the subject. She goes, thank you for watching the kids. And, and I know my mom came to visit and you and her don't really get along that well. How is she doing? He goes, she's on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't want to sugarcoat things, right? But we got to admit we're wrong. Because if we don't admit we're wrong, then we don't grow in humility. A number of years ago, I, was, uh, I got a job before I was supposed to get a job. I was 15 and it was 16 uh, in, this, in Arizona where I was living at the time. And so I lied on my application because I wanted a job. So I put on there, I was 16. Now, this is before I was a Christ follower, if you're wondering. I'm, I still don't go around lying on my applications. But. Cause I, and it was at a seafood restaurant. So I get this job at a seafood restaurant and um, they have a company truck. So they assume I'm, I can drive because I'm 16. And, and, and so he goes up to me and I, I was a prep cook and a dishwasher. He goes, uh, I need you to go and across town and, and do this errand. I don't remember what it is now. And, and I go, okay. You know, I had to pretend I had a license. So I jump in the car and this truck and it's a standard transmission. I've never driven a car at all. <laughs> so I... I figure out how to do it, and as I'm backing up, I end up scratching the employee's car next to me. Now, this is a yellow work truck. This is like a big yellow scratch. <laughs> so I go, and I ended up figuring out how to get across town. I think I trashed the transmission pretty bad, but I came back, and I go back to work, and I delivered, did my delivery. I told him that. Well, in about an hour, he comes in. <clears throat> he, you know, he noticed that you know, I had scratched the truck and he goes and there's all the whole kitchen staff's around like in a big circle and I'm in the middle and I'm so embarrassed. And so he goes, did you scratch this truck? Now, obviously I did a big, you know, I'm the last person using it, huge yellow mark. And I, I just go, no, it's not me. <laughs> you didn't do it. No. I, for some reason, I didn't keep my job long. I'm not sure why. It might have been associated with that. But the, the thing is, we get so caught up in ourselves and so embarrassed, and, and, and really there's an angle of pride to it as well, where we just won't admit our mistakes. And it hurts our relationships. It hurts our success. It hurts our, our, our employment, all of that. The, Proverbs 28, 13 says, A man who refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful. But if he confesses and forsakes them, he gets another chance. I probably needed that verse, you know? <laughs> learned it, learned it. I, I want to get better at, at, at life, certainly in my relationships. And when we admit that we are, we're fallen, when we make mistakes, not with a caveat, yeah, but if you had, you know? And we do that so many times. We get defensive or we get offensive instead of just being humble to saying, yeah, I'm owning this straight up. I'm not blaming anybody else. James 5.16 says, make this your common practice. Circle that practice. I love that because it says this can be something you can grow in. You can make this your common practice. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can live together whole and heal. Now, that takes humility to do that. But when we do that, that's what grows our relationships with, with the people around us. Fourth way to practice courageous humility is to practice surrendering our plans to God. <clears throat> this takes a lot of courage. Our tendency is to think through our own dreams like we did in this past January. What are we going to do with our life? And we have all these goals, all these things we want to accomplish. And then we never really check into God. Now, hopefully this past January, as we've been studying our small groups, we were checking in and saying, God, what do you want me to do with my life? But so often we don't. And then when things don't come together, when things are delayed, when things don't happen at all, we get angry at God. God, why did you let this happen? Why didn't this come through? And it's, well, that's our plans. That's not necessarily his. 
And so part of humility is saying, God, what is your plan for me? What, what do you have for me? James 4 says, God opposes everyone who's proud, but he gives grace to everyone who's humble. So surrender to God. So he says, don't let your plans be in opposition to God. Don't let your life be in opposition to God. I mean, I, I don't want to be opposed to somebody who can clearly not, you know, beat me. I mean, I, if I'm in the octagon, I don't want Floyd Mayweather to be in the octagon with me. I don't want, if I'm, if I'm on a basketball court, I don't want LeBron James there. I mean, it's just, he's, it's going to crush me. If I'm at an auction, I don't want Bill Gates in the auction. I don't have a chance. It's just, I'm going to get blasted. Well, how about God? He's bigger than all those three. I mean, in life, he's, you don't want him opposing you. He says, then get rid of pride. What's the answer? He goes, so surrender to God. That's the answer. Have you done that? Well, you say, God, I want to surrender my life to you. I want to surrender my plans, my dreams, my goals. Romans 6, 13 says, give yourselves to God and surrender your whole being to him to be used for his righteous purchase, righteous purpose. So surrendering means, God, not my way, but your way. I want to do, I want to do the things that you have for me. <clears throat> I want to get in line with, with the purpose that you've created for me. And that's the mission of our, of our church is to help people find and fulfill the purpose that God has for them. And recognize I can't do it all on my, without God's help anyways. You know, it's interesting. Humility is the, it comes from the word, <clears throat> the root word, uh, humanity or human. Actually, humor comes from it as well. And that we, we tend to take ourselves so seriously, but we don't take God seriously enough. And really, it's the reverse. We should be taking God seriously. We don't take ourselves so seriously. We realize, you know, we have limitations. And when we try to live outside of our limitations, that's what causes stress. Like that great theologian said, Clint Eastwood, right? He said, a man's got to know his limitations, <laughs> right? Got to know your limitations. You try to live outside your limitations and you try to do things that you weren't meant to do. That's not your purpose. You end up with stress in your life. That's why we, it's, it's walking in sync in the cadence with God. That's the key. Matthew eleven twenty nine. Jesus says this, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your soul. So he's talking about how to, how to get rid of all that stress. You see, when we live outside of our limitations, we, uh, we, we end up with all the stress. He says, take my yoke upon me. You know what a yoke is? Most of you probably didn't grow up on a farm, so you may not know. But a yoke is just that, that apparatus that goes around two animals that uh, sync them up together so that they can, they can pull something with greater, with, with something that's heavier or harder to pull with, with greater ease, less, less effort. He says, that's what I want to do with you. Come alongside you. And when you're doing, when you're, when you're yoked up with, with Jesus, then you're doing what he wants you to do. You're going in his direction at his pace. Then the stress starts to drop. And it becomes easier to kind of sort through what's most important. What am I supposed to be doing with my life? I like what Micah says. He summarizes it so well. <clears throat> he says, this is what the Lord requires from you. What are the in three things he lists? That you do what is right, that you love mercy, and that you live humbly with your God. So three things. Number one, that you live right, you love mercy, you love mercy, loving kindness, the way you treat people, and you walk in humility. You recognize your own limitations. Hey, there's things I can do, some things I can't do. Most things I need God's help with. And I want to surrender my plans to him. Psalm 119 says, turn me away from wanting any other plans than yours. See, there's a desire angle to this. If we don't work with that desire part, we can say what we want, we can pray what we want, but then we do something else. And so that's why I love this prayer where he says, God, turn me away. Keep my desire from even wanting a plan that's outside of what you have for me. I want what you have for me. Then your stress goes down. Then your relationships get deeper and more intimate and you find yourself starting to succeed in relationships and life. This last verse, thir Psalm 37, 11, says, all who humble themselves before the Lord shall be given every blessing and shall have wonderful peace. So this is, the, this is just another promise that comes from 
stepping into humility, saying, God, I want to be a loving person. And, and, and growing in love is, is a challenge. But the good thing is, is it's something we can practice. It might feel awkward at first. You know, it feels, it feels unnatural. You know, how does this all work? But as we start to do it more and more, we start going, okay, I get this. And it reminds us, God is the one who set me on earth. He has a plan for me. My security is rooted in him and who he made me. I don't have to try to worry about what other people think of me. I don't have to worry about the stress of that. And I remember what's, what's most important is you know, to, do, to, do, to do right, to love mercy, to walk humbly before God. Okay, let's bow our heads and pray. <clears throat> well, God, we're just going to take a moment here and just and just invite you into our space. Would you do that just kind of in your own mind? There's a tendency if we're not, it's just prayer is a, a discipline and a practice as well. And prayer can be a time where you get distracted and you think about the things you need to do, check your phone, and, or it can be a time where you can check in with God. I'm inviting you to do that. Check in with God for you. Say, God, how am I doing? I want to be a humble person that you can bless. Maybe you need to just offload something to God. Get it off your chest. Say, God, I admit that often I do things out of selfishness and pride. I have insecurities that I wrestle with all the time. And it gets in the way of me really operating in, in humility. So God, would you say, God, forgive me. Help, give me strength. Give me a new vision. Help me to desire your plan for my life. And then would you pray and say, God, I want to do, I, I want to practice these habits of humility. Help me to give preference to others. This, today, I'll be given opportunities today to prefer others' needs or interests above my own. Help me not to have to always have things my way. Help me to be open to correction and even criticism so that I don't react being defensive or offensive. We say, God, help me to admit when I'm wrong. And then pray, say, Lord, I surrender my life and my plans to you. I want your will for my life. I turn the controls over to you and humbly ask you to be the director of my life. From this day forward, with your help, guide me. In Jesus' name, amen.